start. So as people continue to trickle in, I just wanted to introduce myself um, and, and get started introducing this session. Uh, my name is Eri Brasuli. I am um, a clinician in the section of hospital medicine and um, in DBHI. And I'm so excited to welcome you to the final session of a program that was two, literally two years in the making. Um, as we've done at each of our prior sessions, I just want to recap um, the colloquium series. You know, we we thought about this um, because we began to appreciate similarities in the ways that informaticists and medical educators approach questions like, how do people learn and how does technology support them? How can learners be supported in their application of knowledge to clinical practice? And how do we assess individuals and learners when they practice in complex care delivery systems where education is just one part of the mission. As those conversations evolved, we learned that our communities, informatics and med medical education share goals, but have sometimes little knowledge of each other when it comes to the language that we speak, the concepts that inform our work, or the methodologies that we use. And because of this, we thought, that what we really needed was to speak and to understand each other through a colloquium, a series of conversations. In our first session, Dr. Dan Schumacher from Cincinnati um, asked us to question the paradigms built into how we approach our work. Is there only one truth or are there multiple ways to make sense of the world? And how does that sort of more complicated vision inform our approach to medical education? How do we use the immense amount of data that we're now able to generate to build a new transdisciplinary future for medical education. Our first panel built on these questions, Dr. Anna Weiss providing a historical understanding of our conception of knowledge and how it has evolved in medical education, posing questions about a 21st century where medical knowledge far outgrows what any tr individual trainee might know at any one point in time. Dr. Rebecca Tenney Suaro introduced questions about how clinical reasoning develops and as to how technology might help learners identify areas for growth, especially for learners that might be struggling. Dr. Evan Orenstein presented evidence that decision support systems can not only support clinical care, but also can augment and support learning at the same time. Our second panel explored knowledge application, specifically how we teach and support learners during their clinical practice. Dr. Jill Posner posed questions about how to balance teaching in a clinical learning environment with, and the need for data um, and using the electronic health record to focus and support teaching, particularly when it comes to decision making. Dr. Maya Dwan from Cincinnati described the electronic health record and bedside efforts to support trainee and team situation awareness around patients at risk for clinical deterioration arguing that when a patient deterioration leads to a bad outcome under the care of a trainee, that represents system failure in terms of prediction, prevention, response, training, and patient recovery. Dr. Jeffrey Gold from OHSU presented his work improving clinical performance and error detection using electronic health record-based simulation focusing on effective use of electronic health record-derived information. In our third session, um, the one that we had just a few weeks ago, we focused on different levels of assessment. Dr. Kate Clancy from University of Pennsylvania discussed a simulation-based approach to assessing individual knowledge and behavior. Dr. Brent Tama shared dashboard-based approach to measuring and communicating about learner needs and progress. And Dr. Jonathan Ron from, from Boston explored how clinical data might be applied to training evaluation. Today, as we wrap up, we will reflect and consider how medical education and informatics might converge at the learn. Um, the aim of this series has been to engage with each other in considering these questions, our, pa our panelists with each other and with you. Um, and beyond that, we um, hope to form a community interested in this intersection. Um, to that end, I'm going to share a QR code with a survey to, to ask you about ways that you um, might want to continue to be involved in this community. 
Um, recordings of all of these sessions are available at dbhi.chop.edu. CME is available for today's session. You'll receive an email to claim credit um, and with another link to our survey. Um, but without further ado today, I'm thrilled to welcome our panelists to continue this conversation. Mark Mai, who's a critical care fellow and an informaticist here at CHOP. John Boyer, who's an assistant professor um, in critical care medicine here at CHOP, and our own Dan West, um, who is an educational leader all over the country, but also here, here at CHOP. Thank you so much. And we can start with Mark. Hi everyone, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. My name is Mark Mai, and I am currently one of the Pediatric Critical Care Fellows at CHOP. Prior to my critical care training, I completed my Clinical Informatics Fellowship here, and will be speaking about some of the work that I started then. Today, I will be discussing the future of trainee education from the perspective of the learner. I'm the co-developer of the Trainee Individualized Learning System, or the TRAIL software platform, which was developed for my Clinical Informatics Fellowship at CHOP. I have not received any financial compensation for the software, from the software. So we know that our trainees spend a lot of time in the HR and the provision of patient care, with some studies suggesting on the order of five plus hours per shift, which may detract from the amount of time that trainees spend with their patients at the bedside. Simultaneously, we know, we know that there's a relationship between the EHR and provider burnout. While a causal relationship has not been proven, observational studies have found that providers feel the pressure of insufficient time for documentation, high administrative burden, and overall a negative perception of the HR. The concept of Herzberg's two-factor theory of motivation from organizational psychology may be familiar to some of you. In it, an organization can alter motivation in the workplace through two groups of factors, known as hygiene factors and motivational factors. Hygiene factors surround the job and include things like company policies, quality of supervision, work relations, pay, and working conditions. Improving these factors decreases job dissatisfaction, but does not necessarily improve job satisfaction. Improving motivational factors, on the other hand, like achievement, career advancement, opportunities for personal growth and recognition, increases job satisfaction and motivation. From another perspective, improvement of hygiene factors might decrease burnout, but it doesn't necessarily increase engagement. We can view the EHR as a hygiene factor in the clinical learning environment. Optimizing the EHR can go a long way towards decreasing burnout for trainees. However, these don't address engagement. Given that trainees and other providers spend so much time in the EHR, is there a way that we can leverage the amount of time that, that they spend to advance motivational factors and improve training engagement and satisfaction? Really, the question is, can we create value from something that seems like a sunk cost? To do this, we must integrate theories of learning that reflect how learning occurs during clinical training, and then use this knowledge to inform how we extract data from the HR in a way that aligns with personal growth for trainees, as well as competency-based education. At the crux behind aligning e training EHR use with educational theory is Kolb's learning cycle. During training, we have concrete experiences with patients that form the cornerstone of how trainees begin to develop their clinical acumen. As William Osler once said, the student begins with the patient, continues with the patient, and ends with the patient. These moments of patient interaction set the foundation for ref reflective observation as learners start to think about how a particular experience in the care of a patient either fits or diverges from what they might expect. During ab abstract conceptualization, trainees might then look, to the, uh, look up the pathophysiology of a disease the patient had or a particular therapy that was used to better understand the mechanisms of action. Finally, during active experimentation, the learner uses what they've learned from previous patient experiences and applies them to novel situations that may have some overlap. You might be asking yourself, what does this have to do with the EHR data? So you might think of the EHR as a ledger of possible in-person or in vivo interactions with patients, but not a true reflection. 
throughout the process of providing patient care, trainees leave behind a breadcrumbs, a string of breadcrumbs throughout the chart, um, like orders placed, notes written, and charts reviewed. However, none of this data actually captured um, says whether or not a given provider was in a room or physically interacted with the patient. Such a, such a metric would be difficult to reliably capture without the use of something like a proximity sensor. How can you then figure out which patients a provider is seen in vivo and not just in silico by the EHR? One might think of using the notes a trainee signed or the orders that they placed or if they were assigned to a given team. This might work for trainees in a frontline role, but how about those who are in a more supervisory role, but nonetheless still providing direct patient care? Using a data source called the access logs, which were originally used for security and privacy and required by all EHRs, we can then start to glean how much time trainees are spending in patients' charts and potentially use as a proxy for real life provider patient interaction. In fact, when we show CHAP residents uh, a list of potential patients that they might have interacted with and asked them to mark only those they had significant interaction with. Uh, when compared against uh, variables from the EHR, time and chart can consistently popped up as a predictive variable. When combined with other common data elements, this only improved the prediction and we were able to predict with stream accuracy which patients pediatric residents were, were most likely interacting with in the clinic, ED, and inpatient settings. And this is really the key behind our trails platform. We're looking at other trainee populations like PICU fellows, endocrine fellows, PEM fellows, and pediatrics residents, and starting to find uh, pediatric residents at other institutions and starting to find similar results. At this point, I often get asked the question, so what? So what if we can figure out which patients our, our trainees are seeing? So what if we can figure out the types of diagnoses are, they're being exposed to? What is a dashboard really gonna show that's actually useful? So I think it's fair to ask, so what? But I think what people really should start to be asking uh, is what if? So taking a step back again and tying this all together in Kolb's learning cycle, we can think of each step of the cycle as having teaching and assessment processes that can support competency-based medical education. For example, one teaching action uh, for concrete experiences might be to provide hands-on experiences aligned with recent teaching like examining a patient together during rounds as a team or participating in a simulation. The assessment process might entail the use of OSCEs or rubrics to assess competence and document performance. In the next few slides, we'll walk through each of the step of Kolb's learning cycle and ask, what if? So in a future state where this is routine, data from the EHR might help learners, uh, teachers, uh, tailor individualized experiences for learners with simulations, interactive learning modules, and chart simulated recall. For example, using our platform, we were able to compare year over year the types of diagnoses that residents were encountering and the volumes um, in various clinical contexts. And then in a year like last year, this can be quite insightful. It might be hard to read in the graphic, but I think the overall trend is pretty clear that residents uh, during the pandemic in 2020 saw fewer diagnoses of pretty much everything, and in particular, respiratory illness. Uh, you might have seen this resonate with you when you see uh, residents with less comfort with bronchiolitis in years past. Prayer arm directors might be able to use this on an ongoing basis to provide pre precision education to their trainees. And similarly, knowledge of a trainee's past experiences can, can then facilitate targeted observation of specific scenarios when assessing various competencies. Moving forward to reflective observation, data from the EHR by trails can help us identify learning gaps or experiential gaps that trainees might be missing, which can then serve as the starting point for debriefing and mentoring conversations. Without such data, we'd be relying on our trainees to reflect on what they've seen relatively little of, but what if they've never seen something that they should have? They might or might not recognize it as an area of need of additional support. From an assessment standpoint, we can start to tie in individualized learning plans that are supported by data. Just imagine drafting SMART goals with objective data in mind. Trainees could then better advocate seeing patients with conditions uh, that, with which they've had minimal experience and clinical mentors can then track uh, progress that, and help them troubleshoot speed bumps. 
Um, in addition, in a collaboration with the NBME, we're hoping to start up a pilot where we can also deliver just-in-time formative assessment questions to learners to help reinforce learning. Imagine seeing a patient with biliary atresia and then shortly thereafter receiving target questions about the Kasai procedure or altering the complexity of a question based on how many previous cases a learner has seen. It might be hard to imagine how EHR-driven educational data could affect concept formation since so much of that process occurs internally with the learner. But imagine trails delivering not only targeted assessment questions, but also specific content like frameworks for better understanding particular pathophysiologies or treatment algorithms linked with rationales. Assessment might entail review of the trails data and quarterly progress reports to be reviewed side by side with mentors. All of this is predicated on the question, what will learners and their mentors do with the data? Will knowing how much volume or variety of diagnoses help them view future patient encounters in a different light? Can we help trainees elevate their thought processes about given conditions more quickly by showing them their growth over time? From an assessment standpoint, we might not only think of patient attribution, but also evaluator attribution. In other words, can we predict which attendings and residents have likely spent more time with one another based on virtual co-location within the EHR? And thus figure out which attendings might be the best evaluators for residents. We have some pilot data suggesting that access like data may be better than scheduling data at figuring out who probably interacted with whom, but we need additional validation to support this work. Also, based on Dan Schumacher's work, we can potentially use a system like Trails to link resident-sensitive quality measures and possible patient outcomes. So I hope that at least some of these ideas and possibilities excite this audience about the future of training education. There's an opportunity to use the HR to shine the spotlight on motivational factors like achievement and personal growth to improve in training engagement with their own education and support competency-based medical education. And while not all of these ideas may come to fruition, what is clear is that the road ahead is bright, but requires close collaboration between medical educators and informaticians. We must help each other uh, anticipate the potential roadblocks of how this data might be used and negative consequences, like in the use of licensure and certification. Hopefully, as a community, we can together figure out a way to make best use of this data, support our learners, and improve medical education. Thank you for taking the time to attend this symposium, and I look forward to our discussion. That was a little bit of an abrupt cutoff. Sorry there, Mark. Um, quick question for you. Um, I loved the bit about um, targeted assessment questions. Uh, are there ways that you've thought of to use clinical data to help educators evaluate decision making um, and and um, yeah, I think I think that's a tricky thing to do in the moment necessarily to evaluate decision making, but I think that's a really good question. Um, and one way that you can think about approaching this is to look at potential orders that uh, trainees are placing, um, or to look at the quality of their notes, which are, which would require uh, advanced analytics like NLP or text analytics to actually get that done. I think, but as, sort of as you're alluding to, you can potentially use formative assessment questions uh, at different sort of steps. Um, at different steps in terms of one's thought process to gauge um, how complex a learner or trainee might be thinking about a given problem or decision. And I think that might be one way to address it. For example, if um, on a scale like zero, one to five on a competency, uh, a trainee is rating a two, you might just deliver um, a question that is related to a level two question for that given uh, content. Um, and that might be one way to start to get at what's actually going on in their brains as they're thinking. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark. Next up, we have Don Boyer. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today as we think together about how to medical education and informatics can converge in acquiring, applying, and assessing knowledge. I'm Don Boyer, the Program Director for the Pediatric Critical Care Medicine Fellowship Program here at CHOP, and one of the Associate DIOs. As I think about this from a convergence from a program leadership perspective, 
One of the first areas that sticks out to me is the ability of informatics to aid in informing program leaders about case volumes, patient exposures, and other quantitative measures of training. Measures that, if they're being tracked right now, have largely relied upon self-reporting of individual case and procedure logs, a system that we actually know is notoriously flawed. However, I think we need to be careful and go beyond bean counting to gauge what experiences our trainees are having and ensure that those experiences are actually meaningful and contribute to learning as they develop their necessary professional competencies. We all know that the practice of medicine has undergone an evolution in how it has been taught and how professional competence has been determined. In the early apprenticeship model, training would end when a mentor deemed their apprentice ready for independent practice. This morphed into a time-based model of training, whereby training would end after an individual completed a required minimum amount of training, barring any needs for remediation or additional experience. As you can imagine, in both of these systems, there is a lacking standard for professional competence. Training is now in the midst of a shift to competency-based development, whereby trainees must demonstrate competence in the areas that are foundational to the practice of the specialty or subspecialty. And this new model requires clear definitions and assessments of competence if it is to be successful. And I think it is here that informatics can play a key role. In such a competency-based approach to training, this Dreyfus model of learner development informs the progression of an individual through the various stages of development from novice beginner to expert clinician with progressive scaffolding of abilities. As an individual is allowed or entrusted with more and more responsibility with less and less supervision. For those of us in graduate medical education, it is the job of our programs to move individual learners through these stages, especially moving them to a point where they are entrusted to practice without supervision by the time they complete their training. But what are the competencies we are assessing and what are the tools we have at our disposal to determine if competency is achieved? While it's beyond the scope of this section to go into much detail, Competency-based models of healthcare training rely upon the health needs of the patients and communities we serve to determine ultimately the competencies and outcomes that are most important. This then forms the foundation for what we will teach in our curricula and what we will assess in our learners. In graduate medical education, these are largely informed by the ACGME's six core competencies and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement's quadruple aim. Thinking specifically about the convergence of informatics and medical education, I can particularly see clear opportunities for programs to use data to assess some of these competencies, like patient care, practice-based learning and improvement, systems-based practice, improvements in population health, and value-based care. As we think about what to leverage informatics in assessing, I think back to Dan Schumacher's talk kicking off this colloquium. Dan spoke about the tension in training that ultimately arises from the fact that we provide care by teams within systems, but ultimately we certify and credential individuals. Thinking about the convergence between informatics and medical education from this framework, we can imagine ways in which informatics can pro provide learners and programs with valuable information and opportunities at each of these levels to inform competency assessments. For example, at the team level, information within the electronic health record can help to determine what team members participated together in care delivery, potentially informing team-based assessments that evaluate performance and outcomes for the patient, while also being a channel by which evaluations can be distributed and collected to team members informing a 360-degree multi-source feedback system for trainee development. Within the system level, informatics can help identify when and how clinical decision support tools are launched and implemented, when they're deviated from, and what the outcomes might be in both situations. Such systems can also provide opportunities for just-in-time training for the individual learner or the care team as they engage within the electronic health record. And at the individual trainee provider level, 
systems that allow delivery of just-in-time information or quizzing for enhancing knowledge acquisition, assessment, and inspiring self-motivated learning can all be potential future applications, in addition to tracking case exposures and patient outcomes. With these possibilities in mind, as program leaders, we can be excited about the potential for getting beyond mere county, counting of experiences, and instead of knowing the numbers of beans, we can gain a better understanding of what our trainees are using the beans for. Such a transition allows us to shift our thinking from quantitative evaluations of patient encounters, diagnostic exposures, et cetera, to understanding more about the actual depth of a trainee's involvement, the richness of that learning opportunity, how the experiences align with the trainee's goals and the outcomes of such interactions. I think the trails work that Mark and others have been doing for the last several years is a great example of this focus on shifting from involvement to actual meaningful involvement. As we do this, it allows programs to have additional tools at our disposal for identifying where individual learners are in their career development as compared to the actual trainee's goals so that we as programs can help them fill any gaps to reach the competencies that we're responsible for ensuring that they actually achieve throughout the course of their training. As we consider this usage of informatics and learner assessment, it will be important to remember a few key points. First one being that multiple assessments and sources of data are needed to provide the most accurate representation of competence. I think this is best remembered through the parable of the blindfolded individuals feeling the various parts of the elephant only deeming their perspective to be quote unquote true. In order to have the most accurate representation of a trainee's exposure and competence, informatics may be a key part, but must be rounded out by other data that provides a holistic picture of experience and ability. While informatics may be able to provide key performance data about numbers and types of exposures, outcomes of patients, costs of care, etc. The true impact on learner development must also take into account the impact of the experience on the trainee, assessments of the trainee by others involved in the experience, and how the trainee is using the experience to inform and motivate future learning. With this combination of information, learners can more holistically develop their professional competencies toward independent practice. The second consideration as we envision the ability of informatics to serve as a tool in learner development is the consideration of key parameters or characteristics of a tool. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail here, but it's really important to remember that if we think about informatics as a tool in education, we have to consider these features such as reliability. Are we able to get consistent results from the tool? Its validity. Are we actually able to measure what we want to be measuring in an accurate fashion? The educational impact. What, how do uh, learners and programs perceive the impact of the tool and its functionality? Cost effectiveness of the tool. And finally, acceptability should all be considered and explored as we move in this direction. Finally, if we're to leverage informatics for trainee development, we must keep in mind the essential balance that must exist between creating opportunities for learners to acquire necessary experience as they build mental representations and frameworks for their professional development, and the necessary focus on safety of both patients and learners that must exist in our clinical learning environments. There may be tendencies as we gather more and more data to make linkages that could negatively impact trainees' abilities to continue acquiring the necessary experiences, and we must be vigilant about guarding against such risks. If we can keep these ideas in mind as we explore this convergence, I think we can truly leverage informatics not just to quantify experiences, but to really leverage these experiences for their full richness, helping programs ensure the growth and development of each of our trainees in reaching their full development. Thank you so much, Don. Um, one, one question that, that I've been thinking about as you think about moving to evaluate not just individuals but, but teams and programs is the tension between our efforts to standardize practice um, and to standardize documentation um, so as to assure sort of quality um, for, for our patients, which we can do at a team level, but how you kind of then go back and appreciate 
the heterogeneity of teams or programs, um, you know, because on the one hand, we are trying to deliver a more or less standardized product to our patients, but also you want to be able to evaluate individual teams. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And I think some of it in my mind as a program director gets back to, you know, Kolb's learning cycle that Mark introduced us to or brought to our attention, which is really like, you know, we can, we can understand those concrete experiences that an individual or a team has, but we have to then figure out a system um, that goes back and kind of assesses how our teams or how our individuals really kind of reflecting on that experience and how are they um, analyzing that experience and potentially thinking about the future application of, of the lessons that they're learning. So I think, you know, to me, that's a that's at the heart of where the informatics interface may actually limit us. Um, and we're going to have to supplement those encounters with um, the deeper questions, the deeper conversations with learners um, to really understand what are they making of those experiences. I don't know if that answers your question. No, oh, that's great. Um, and then our final presentation of our final session um, with Dr. Dan Wax. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here and to be one of the last speakers in this great series um, that we've had about the um, the opportunities between medical education and clinical informatics. And my focus will be on um, the way those two uh, disciplines can converge to help support learning health systems. And um, that will be my focus today. So let's start by thinking about what is a learning health system. You may have your own idea of what one is. Um, you've probably heard about that concept before. Um, the Agency for Research in Healthcare Quality um, has been leading efforts in developing learning health systems and the concept of um, uh, helping support the cycle of safe, reliable, effective delivery of healthcare. And it centers around, at, at least their definition of it, centers around this concept of moving from evidence or taking evidence and creating knowledge out of that, taking that knowledge to practice changing and altering practice based on that knowledge, and then generating data again from practice and those practice changes to generate more evidence to continue in this cycle along the lines that I have this, this uh, figure shows to drive this process of learning health system improvement and improving the safety, reliability, and effectiveness of healthcare delivery. So as I think about it from my perspective, in medical education, I think about what are the, the critical elements of a learning health system. And so one obvious one is people. So skilled, competent workforce is really important for an effective learning uh, health system. But there's also the elements of data collection and synthesis because you need to generate data to um, generate the evidence that leads to knowledge and leads to practice change. And then it's really important what you do with that information, how it's used for feedback, how it's interpreted, how decisions are made, what are the consequences of those decisions, which all creates a clinical learning environment. And that's, that's really been the focus of a lot of my work here at, uh, at CHOP. So in the rest of my talk, I really want to focus on this from the, um, the, uh, uh, the lens of thinking about those critical elements of a learning health system. So let's start with the notion of how do we get um, a skilled, competent workforce and what that means. So to do that, we need to understand what competency is. And in an understanding competency, I just wanna use an example of, if you think about driving a car. So this picture, this picture is of some people driving cars um, across the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. Um, and if you think about that, that the competence involved in doing that. One could divide that up and break it down into individual competencies in order to drive a car. Like for example, accelerating and braking smoothly or turning left at an intersection, that could be a competency. 
And then you can think about the assessment of competency. How do you know that someone can do those things? So people typically to get a driver's license, they need to pass a driver education class, or they need to pass a practical driver exam or a written exam, those kinds of things could be measures of that. And then there's the notion of higher order or outcome-based competency. And that is when you start to put all those things together to actually drive in places and in certain conditions. So thinking about driving safely and effectively on a freeway in LA or in downtown San Francisco, where this picture's from, or on an icy road in Philadelphia in the winter. So those require a, the use of a lot of competencies and using those together. So to determine someone's driving skill, it really requires a shared uh, model of competency in order to do that and figure out how to assess that and, and to arrive at that conclusion. So in medical education, competency models have been developed to try to develop this shared model of, of competency. There are reductionist models that you um, all are probably familiar with, the ACGME model at least, which has six domains of competence and inside each of those six domains are a number of individual competencies with milestones attached to them. So we know this as the milestones. There's CanMeds that are, is used in Canada, which is a really excellent competency-based system. But these would all fall into the category of competency models that are reductionist models. So we break it into its component parts and try to understand it that way. And then there, there are global models of competency. And the one that has gained the most traction and one that I'll show you some more information about is the concept of entrustable professional activities or EPAs. It's an example of a global model. That's that higher order competency. I'm taking all of those small competencies and putting them together to do things. So um, it synthesizes some of these reductionist approaches. So um, here, different models, different ways of doing this. We've been doing a lot of work with EPAs and pediatrics, and, and some of you, um, many of you might be very familiar with that. But there's one concept I will really want to drive home here. And that is um, this concept um, um, based on this quote from George Fox, who was a British statistician, who uh, famously said, essentially all models are wrong, but some are useful. So the idea is there's no perfect model. A model is just a way of trying to come to understand something. And so <clears throat> the important thing here is you need to develop a model that is useful to you, even though it will not be completely correct. And that's what we strive for. So we think about um, the concept of, of competency in the medical education world, there's the notion of competency-based medical education. And that's the development and maintenance of that skilled workforce that I was, was talking about that's a critical part of a health system. So if you think about the development of competence, whatever model you're using, that that develops over time. And typically the way this would happen is along the x-axis here, I have time. And initially for a workforce, there's a period of training. My area is in, in graduate medical education. There's undergraduate medical education. There's nursing training. There's other health professions. And there's a period of training that occurs here. And a pretty steep growth in the development of a competency over that period of time. Health systems care a lot about this, which is the phase of deliberate professional practice. And this is when, where you spend most of your career after you've finished formal training. And you can see under this kind of a model that co your competency grows over that time. At some point here on the, uh, on the y-axis, there's a competency threshold. There's some point where you're competent enough to start to function on your own. And um, that's the goal is people want to try to cross that threshold but they don't want to stop there. You want to continue to grow. So you think about that particular competency. There are other competencies. You can break this up into some component parts. Um, and so the growth of those competencies will vary depending on what the competency is in the individual trying to uh, learn how to do that. So you can model this out at many different competencies. And here's an interesting one. Competencies that someone might never completely achieve to the point where they could do something independently. The point of competency-based medical education, though, is that at some point, you can make an evidence-based advancement decision that someone's ready to leave training and go out into practice. 
So a model that um, that I've used a lot and that um, has a lot of utility is the the model of EPAs or entrustable professional activities. And just a little bit more detail about those. Those involve um, synthesizing competencies into workplace-based activities, things you can see that are obvious to the people who are trying to do them. And the, the assessment scale on that is how much supervision do you need in order to do that? And in EPAs, there's the concept of making entrustment decisions, the notion that a trainee crosses a threshold where you can allow them to, you can entrust them to do something more independently. So this is all program level uh, work here and institution level too and uh, system level. Don's talk focused a lot on these kinds of issues and how you make these kinds of decisions. And then it also has though utility at the individual level. So as you're trying to build that skilled workforce, providing feedback to trainees and to really be an important element of feeding into that cold learning cycle that Mark talked about. And the uh, real advantages of this kind of a model is it's very intuitive to both supervisors and trainees, and it's criterion-based. So I just wanted to show you this. I couldn't resist. This is some data from a project that I've been heavily involved with over the last almost 10 years, which um, is called EPAC. Um, it's a competency-based medical education pilot that played out in real life. We used EPAs as a model. This just shows you those EPA growth curves of actual trainees. These are medical students as they progress through training. And there, we do, there were different EPAs that were defined. We had a model for that that was developed by the AAMC. And we had developed um, a priori, a competency-based threshold for graduation. In other words, um, along this y-axis is just levels of supervision. The details are not important. But we determined that once a trainee cr crossed this 3A level, that they were good to go. And you can see the trajectory of these different competencies, that it's variable based on the competency, and that um, they cross this threshold well before this time-based graduation threshold, which was the fourth quarter of the fourth year of medical school. So this is really where these uh, competency-based medical education can play out. So as I think about how informatics and medical education um, could work together in the future. Um, we need data. <laughs> to do any of the things that we're talking about, we need data, and that's where we can get a lot of help, I think, from, from clinical informatics to collaborate together to do that, to uh, data to inform program level competency and advancement decisions, to provide feedback uh, for reflection in the COBE learning cycle, like Mark talked about, to generate the evidence to knowledge and knowledge to practice improvement that learning um, health systems care about. But critical uh, gaps exist here, our ability to collect th these data, display them and synthesize them. And the other ways that we can work together is in the feedback interpretation and consequences of the data. So what are the, uh, these are really critical elements of a learning, of our clinical learning environment and a uh, learning health system. The goal to support growth mindset and mastery learning behaviors. This whole concept that I'm trying to get better every day, that when I encounter difficult things, I work through them, I don't quit. Um, the whole notion, all the work of Angela Duckworth and growth mindset, master adaptive learning, and the model of, of how we grow and improve as an individual. So we want individual program level and system level improvement and data to inform that. The problem is our systems don't really produce enough of these outcomes. I think we all can agree on that. And the, the truth is that, um, uh, you know, the, uh, this famous saying that has been attributed to several different people, but this famous saying that, saying that every system is perfectly designed to achieve exactly the results that it gets is so true in this situation. So system's not broken. We need to break the system. Uh, because it's not getting the results. So the system's working very effectively to get a different result than what we really want. So when I think about the future of learning health systems, um, we need to redesign our systems. We need to break them, uh, the current systems. We have big data needs, both big data, like big data, uh, but also lots of data needs in medical education and clinical informatics that will be enormously fertile ground for collaboration. We've seen many examples of that through the course of uh, this um, 
of, of the various uh, sessions that we've had in this um, medical informatics, I mean, uh, clinical informatics and medical education sessions. And then we need feedback, we need evidence and data to provide feedback to support learning cycles, evidence to ensure competent workforce and the delivery of safe, reliable care. So feedback on our systems. And we need to be careful about the decisions and consequences of those decisions and align incentives to get the learning health system we want and patients need. So I hope this helps uh, generate some discussion and thought about how we can work together in clinical informatics and education, education to achieve, to achieve the, type the type of learning, learning health, health system, system that we all, we all want. want. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Thank you so much. For our, for, we have a few minutes to discuss, and there's some interesting questions in the chat. Naveen, do you want to ask your question? Um, I can read it. Uh, sure. Thanks. Um, this was uh, an amazing uh, recap, I think, of and 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 uh, synthesis of uh, many of the ideas that have come up in the previous session. So thank you to the panel for that. Um, one question that I had is, it seems like one, you know, um, you know, I think Dan's slide where there's sort of this point where we establish progression from training to to practice, um, and it, and it could be a little bit arbitrary as to when that point is, but you know, um, the premise behind that sort of point suggests that there's like a core body of you know knowledge, skills, attitudes, or uh, and trustable professional activities. Um, that that a learner could be assessed against, and I'm curious, um, you know, at that sort of system level, how this panel thinks about establishing what that core um, uh, is, and is there a role for informatics there as well, and what do you imagine that might be if that's the case? Well, maybe I'll start. I, I you know, I I really enjoyed listening to Mark and Don's uh, talk, which gave me some ideas about that that very notion. Um, when you think about um, trying to understand what are the experiences that are most important and how do those experiences based on data, let's say that's generated through clinical informatic techniques like trails that, uh, that Mark was describing, how do those, what's the relationship between those and the general impressions that supervisors have when they're working with trainees? Um, one thing we know about competence is that it's dynamic. It's not a fixed state. It's dependent on context. It's dependent on time and experience. And so how does that change over time? And how could we use, how could we track um, both the beans and, and the, both the number of beans and the types of beans and the types of dishes that are made with them? by both trainees and people who are out in continuing professional development and in practice. How could we use that information to alter what they're allowed to do over time or what they feel supported to do? And I'll, I'll stop here in a second. I am a perfect example of this. I've been an oncologist clinically for a long time and I made a shift once I came to CHOP to starting to do hematology. And I can tell you, that there are aspects of hematology that I should have some supervision on. And in fact, I go and seek that out because I didn't, don't have that experience anymore. I've lost some of that. Um, so I'm doing it voluntarily. Um, so the question is how can, from a systems perspective, we might wanna tighten that up and be able to give people more guidance and more ways to reenter the workforce or to shift careers, things like that. I'm gonna stop. I think it's a great question and building off of what Dan said in his, his talk, I think it gets to the idea of the ability of informatics to give us some data to, to drive this, right, Naveen? I think um, I, the example that came quickly to mind was the removal within the last decade or so from the RRC for pediatrics requirements for trainees to be competent or quote unquote um, in intubations, right? Um, I think a lot of that was largely driven by expert consensus and a group of people sitting in a room probably um, saying, you know what, my experience is that I don't intubate that much, trainees don't intubate that much. And there's nothing wrong with that type of decision making, but imagine how powerful that would be taken to the next level if we actually had data to support that, right? If we knew that residents are not intubating across all of these programs, um, or these are the situations in which they do. And the decisions then around what core 
knowledge, skills, and attitudes or behaviors need to drive training and be part of what's expected of programs to teach um, is then more data-driven and not simply expert consensus. And I think to build on that a little bit and to touch on what Daria had mentioned earlier about how this is a spectrum of learning across not just uh, graduate medical education, but continuing medical education, you, you can even map that across, um, say, uh, a trainee went on to become a hospitalist. What does that hospitalist do based on the numbers? Do they actually do intubations? And thus, is it actually important for residents to do intubations or other types of procedures? And I think it can help sort of develop um, some repository of evidence for actually aligning those. And could, could I add to that, to the, both those excellent comments? Um, to help inform uh, from a systems and a program level what training should consist of and what the rules should be. So Don, the requirement for intubations, that has been in place way longer than it should have been um, because we didn't know or there wasn't good evidence. And so Mark, as you described, you know, if you had the evidence, we could move potentially much more quickly to design training the way it should be and the way, way um, various areas of medicine are practiced. I'm also, th sorry, I, I, it just popped, occurred to me too that we, we're talking about a lot of this from the trainee and program and institution level, but think about how powerful this could be also from the applicant level, right? To have a sense of being able to look at a dashboard about what experiences are afforded to trainees um, or professionals in this context versus that context as they decide you know, where they wanna do their training or where they wanna become faculty members, like having a dashboard of experiences and exposures that are, uh, that are comprised there. I think about the stories anecdotally of our um, residents here who see probably more um, hyperinsulinism than they do diabetes, right? And so like, what, how does that inform people's decisions as they think about the, their own career trajectories potentially? I, I really like that idea. This has been a great conversation. I'll even like push that a little bit further to say like, you know, that can be, I think, really informative, like for applicants and then trainees. I think we also um, have this notion that like where you are uh, a trainee or where you are, uh, where you practice is kind of where you stay. But I think one of the great things in training is that, you know, there does exist this idea of like a wave rotation. So, you know, like, great, like, where might I do an away rotation to broaden my experiences and using data to like inform those decisions would be great. And I think about, um, you know, even like as a, again, like, not that I'm always thinking about myself, but I consider myself a continual learner, but like, how would that information be really helpful to me to continue my professional development like might i want to go somewhere else you know if my employer is okay with it to learn about um, something specific that i could actually then come back and like provide better care or bring value to chop or vice versa like you know so we could you know be able to say like yes like come here whoever to um, gain experience in hyper insulinism and like, it's great that we have that center here, but like, how do we kind of spread and disseminate the care so that we can actually provide better care to lots more children? So I think those are kind of the, the bigger um, implications of being able to use that data to understand how we might actually do better care and like have individuals like develop better skills and competencies. Um, it's 12.47, so, so maybe we have time for, for one more comment or question. Um, Dr. Callahan, you also made an interesting point in the, in the chat. Um, I'm wondering if you, if you want to say out loud or, or he, he asks, he says, you know, that, that he has looked at using systems similar to the one that Mark describes to gather about clinical competence for physicians in practice. Um, a point that Daria made earlier, but is is that that they haven't found meaningful ways to um, to sort of link physicians in practice in that way. Um, Mark, what what have you, as you leave, prepare to leave fellowship? Have you thought about what trails might look like for you? 
or for, I, for people. In a read, maybe I can just clarify a little bit because Mark actually tried to help us a bit. Bemol was trying to help us do this a couple of years ago. And, you know, what you find is there's lots of trails between attendings, but it might be in an adult setting because we were doing it at Penn as well. Um, you know, the most common person who interacted with me in a chart, if I was an ER doctor at HUP, was the cardiologist that read the EKGs. And there was no interaction there that you could really get feedback either way, uh, so, um, but thinking about how to do that in some way is, uh, I think, important as a way to build feedback for us as we go on. Yeah, and I think that's, um, I think the challenge is uniquely summed up, so just as you mentioned it, Jim, um, I think for, you know, the, the study that we had done was, the pilot study was looking at residents and overnight supervising residents with interns, and so I think the links there between two individuals who are spending probably lots of amount, a greater amount of time than attendings are in a given chart. Um, probably makes a little bit more sense, but when you get to attendings or consulting services, it, it gets a little bit tricky. Um, and there, as you're sort of alluding to, there aren't a lot of breadcrumbs that are left behind that you can actually point to um, meaningful interactions between two individuals caring for the same patient. It's a little, um, that part's a little bit tricky and I think you know, I'm still struggling and thinking about ways to figure that out, but I don't know if we will get there anytime soon. It was interesting when, when you were helping us and BMO was looking, the thing that the relationships that came out most um, strongly were uh, trainees with attendings, right? So if a trainee was on Five West and, and, you know, the attending was there, you saw all of those interactions. And obviously there is a lot of direct interaction there in a very different way. So. Thank you. This has been a wonderful series. I want to thank all of you for your efforts. And... Well, thank you all for joining us. Um, again, if, if you have a moment to complete the, the survey to help us think about um, what other things we might continue to present or other ways um, to continue um, this conversation, that would be very helpful to us. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Don. Um, um, and thank you to, to all the people who've helped with this. Um, Donna, um, Mark, and um, Hannah, and Tony, Naveen, um, this has been really fun to, to work on with you guys and hopefully just the beginning. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.